I'd like to read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, for a message this morning. Verse 21. Paul talking about being filled with the Spirit. He says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, and giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he begins to deal with individuals, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. <coughs> Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify, having cleansed it with the washing of water by the word, and that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined or married or glued unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I'd like to speak to you about the mystery of the church. And I'd like to point out, first of all, that the mystery of the church is a part of the mystery of the gospel. And let us not make the same mistake that is made by so many Bible expositors in this passage of Scripture in believing that the message of the passage is the type itself. The type is marriage, but the antitype or the fulfillment of that type is Christ and the church. The mystery Paul writes about is the relationship of the church to Jesus Christ, and he uses the relationship of husband and wife as an illustration of this great mystery. The teaching of Ephesians 5 is not on the Christian home, and it is not on the marriage relationship. It is on the relationship of the Lord Jesus to the church. In the book of Hebrews, we're told that all the types were shadows, but Christ was the reality. He was the substance. So let us not tarry with the type, with the shadow, but go on to the reality and the substance. And yet in going to the reality and the substance, to the fulfillment, to the antitype, if your heart's listening, you'll hear much about the type itself which is marriage, and earthly marriage, between a man and woman here in this present time. I'd like to establish a couple of things because I've been running into some difficulties with this from out there among those who listen to the tapes. Uh, I've been questioned about my use of the bride as a title for the church. And I want to thank those who questioned me on that because it drove me back to the scriptures to make sure that what I believed I found here in the book instead of just in somebody else's book. And I'd just like to put everybody's heart at rest at this moment and tell you that the church, which is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, is also the bride and also the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in Ephesians 5, there is no argument. The church and the wife are the same. The church and the body and the wife are the same. And the church is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh because the church is his wife. But you say that doesn't explain the use of the term bride. Well, it does in that no wife becomes a wife until she first of all has become a bride. And so if she is now the wife of the Lord Jesus, she has at one time or another been his bride. So when I speak of the bride of Christ, I'm speaking of the church. When I speak of the church, I'm speaking of that called out assembly, those who've been called out of Jews and Gentiles, but primarily from among the Gentiles, 
by the preaching of the gospel mystery of God's grace in Jesus Christ, worked and accomplished through his work in his substitutionary atonement. Those who have been called out to the preaching of the gospel, those who have heard the gospel invitation with their hearts, those who have heard the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and have come, have been joined by the Holy Spirit of God to Jesus Christ in a living relationship so that he says they are now bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and members of his own spiritual body over which he is the head. And in this relationship, he says, it is the relationship that is like the relationship of a husband to his wife. And he says that the great mystery of his teaching here is to explain that through the type of marriage, the great antitype of his relationship to his own might be seen and understood. Now, there are many types in the New Testament of the relationship of the Lord Jesus to those whom he saves. This message is directed primarily to them. There's an individual relationship where he speaks of us as his sheep and himself being the shepherd. There's corporate relationships where he speaks of the church as being a body over which he's the head, a living organism. And then he speaks of the church being a building which he indwells, a temple built up for the habitation of God made out of living stones. There's lots of pictures here in the Word. In fact, the church is pictured in Ephesians, the second chapter, as a new man, a man that never existed before the church came into existence, a man made whole by the church being joined to the eternal man who was the Lord Jesus himself. But of all the types and shadows of the relationship of the saved to Jesus, the most intimate of all and the most beautiful of all is this relationship of Christ and his wife or his bride. It's intimate because it's the story of a love affair. And it is the love affair of Jesus for her and the love affair of the bride for Jesus. And it covers the entire scriptures, beginning in Genesis, as I found in my studies in the last two weeks, and ending up in the book of Revelation. It is the story of this book, how God loved us through his blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how he desired us to be his sons and daughters, and how he sent the beloved Son to make it possible in his atoning work for us to be a part of God's holy family and made like himself so that we might call him a father. But one of the hidden mysteries in it all was that when this work was finished, God not only obtained the family, but he obtained it by this means, by giving those he loved to his own blessed Son as a love gift to him. And in giving them to him, they became his bride. And so, loving the Son, he loves the church in the Son. And loving the church in the Son, he has accepted the church in the Son as his very own. And now he is my father and your father, and we are his sons and daughters, but all oh, to Jesus, we're his bride. And especially precious in that we are the bride his father chose for him. And we are the bride that it's the love gift of his father to him. And we are the bride so joined to him for all eternity that we shall never be separated from him again. And God will never look upon him without looking upon us, and he will never look upon us without looking upon him. Jesus Christ will never be received in any place where I am not received. He will never experience what I shall never experience. We have become one. I am bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. I am part of his body. I am a part of himself. He and I are married. We're glued. We're joined together. And what God hath joined together, no man can put asunder. No separation will ever come between us. Having fallen in love with Jesus because he first loved me, 
having been joined to him by saving faith through grace, and that saving faith is just loving him because he loved me, I've been joined to him in such a way that no man can put us asunder, no thing can put us asunder. In the closing verses of Romans chapter 8, we learn that no principalities or powers, angels or things present or things to come, and he names all the things that come to the mind and imagination of man, but he says in none of them will we ever see or experience any separation from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a marriage that will never be broken. No divorce will ever interrupt it. No misunderstanding will ever arise that will divide us. No lack of communication will ever sever our blessed fellowship. He is mine and I am his for all eternity. And this is the relationship of Jesus to his own precious bride. And that's what I want to talk to you about. We see in Ephesians 5 we have the truth of 1 Corinthians 15, 6 again, where Paul tells us that the gospel that he preached was according to the scriptures. And the scriptures he refers to are the Old Testament scriptures. And so Paul, writing in Ephesians 5, when he wants to tell us about the relationship of Jesus and the church, he takes us clear back to the book of beginnings in Genesis and tells us about Adam and Eve. And nothing could be clearer or plainer than the statements made in Ephesians 5 that lead us to this conclusion that Adam and Eve and the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2 were put there for one purpose only, and that was to demonstrate at a later time in history to the saints of this dispensation their relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ and how that relationship was established. Another blessed thing, you see, we find in the Genesis account, that's where our studies are going to be here this morning, that for the first time the man God created is named, and he is called Adam. And it's the first time that name appears in the Scriptures. And he is the first Adam, but he is not to be the last Adam. The first Adam was the head of the human race. The federal head, that is, the entire race that was to come, was in Adam, right? The only time it ever happened. The whole potential of mankind was in the loins of Adam when he walked the garden alone with God. He, therefore, was the father of all who would live. He was the ancestor of the entire family on this earth. He, therefore, was the single head of the entire human race. But the scripture tells us that there was to be not a second Adam, but a last Adam. One more who would replace him in this unique relationship to the race. And he's identified in 1 Corinthians 15:45 as the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's referred to as that last Adam. That Adam who came and gathered unto himself all mankind. He did this in the cross of Calvary and became, as Adam, the federal head of the entire human race. And as Adam acted for us all when he sinned, Jesus Christ acted for us all when he died. As in Adam all die, but as in Christ, the same for whom, uh, the same who were affected by the sin of Adam were affected by the finished work of Christ at the cross of Calvary. So if you have that type established from the scriptures, and we do, and therefore we're not violating the scriptures, but we're pleasing the Holy Spirit in asking him to explain a little more to us about Jesus being a type of a fulfillment of Adam as a type, then we go back to the second chapter of Genesis, and here, here we have the story of Adam and, and how he got his bride. And we have the story of the bride and her relationship to the groom. We have the whole story of Jesus' relationship to the church, and that's what I want to talk to you about because it is called the mystery of Christ and his church. Back here in the, in the second chapter of Genesis, let me read verse 18 through 25. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and he brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Once there ever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And notice, Adam gave names to all cattle, 
to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And he brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. First of all, the need is here, and I want to talk to you about that. After God had created everything, he looked around and he discovered something which he said was not good. And I don't want to get into any technical difficulties over that phrase, not good, but it doesn't mean that it was evil in itself, but God saw out into the future that the condition which prevailed, which was the aloneness of Adam, was a condition which would contribute to a wrong situation later on. He saw the need ahead of time before it arose. He saw that it wasn't good for Adam to continue on in creation alone. Only God saw that need in Adam. And so seeing that need, he defines it here. There was no thing in all of creation that was fit for Adam's fellowship. There was nothing in all of creation that could help Adam, assist him, contribute to his welfare. And there was nothing in all the creation that was good enough for Adam's fellowship to share his lordship, to share his life. Adam was incomplete. And I didn't think that verse 19, 20 ever had anything to do with Adam and Eve, but it does. Because what's emphasized here is that after God created everything, he gave to Adam the lordship over it all, and Adam surveyed this entire creation. He went one by one over the animals and he named them. That means he had to give them some consideration, didn't he? And he went one by one over the fowls of the air and he named them. He went over every living thing in creation and he gave them peculiar names which he thought suited them. But the tragic thing is after he had surveyed everything that God had created, he still had not found anything that was fit to bear his name. He was not found among anything God had created, someone who was fit for his fellowship or suited to help him or to relieve his needs in his loneliness. And when God saw that Adam had surveyed the entire creation and yet had found no one for his heart, God moved to meet that need. And he moved by the sovereignty of his will. And he said, I will. And this is what he decided to do. I will make, he said, and help me. For him. And I'll give you the story first as briefly as I can, you see, and then I'll go back and give you the antitype, which is what we're here to learn about. And so God, by the sovereignty of his own will, created someone that had never existed before, and this someone was created especially. The eternal purpose of this creation was that she might be made for Adam's pleasure for his delight, for his help me. The word help me means an exact counterpart. She was to be made exactly like Adam, that she might help him in all that he did. She would never be a man because she was made out of a man. But she was made as an exact counterpart. All that he needed was found reflected in the blessedness of Eve. And here's how God did it. Strange way that he did it. Why couldn't he have just said, let there be an Eve? Like he said, let there be a sun and a moon and the stars and the earth and the planets. 
But he did it in a very strange and peculiar and mysterious way. And here you see the mystery of the gospel is laid deep in the roots of Genesis. He suddenly caused this unusual, unnatural, deep sleep to come upon Adam apparently in the daytime. A sleep's natural to man, but this kind of sleep wasn't natural. The original word in the Hebrew brings out the fact that it was a supernatural kind of sleep that came upon him. A sleep that originated outside of himself. A sleep that had its direct cause in God itself. And while Adam slept, while he was unconscious, if you were, and if you let me just toy with a phrase here, as he was dead, as it were, God did something to him. God took out of his body something that was once a part of Adam, an integral part of Adam. He took from him something that he never got back again until he got Eve. Something that made him incomplete until God brought him that which made him complete in the person of Eve. In this deep sleep, and I have seen some things here I dare not even touch on because I'll be so far in over my head I'll never get out. But I begin to, you know, I have silly questions like exactly what part of his body did that thing come from and was it really a rib? I don't think it was identified in the original language as being specifically a rib, but it was some part of his flesh that was removed. And it was, it, I did find out the general area of the body from which it came, and this blessed my heart, brethren, because it came from his breast. And I like to believe that it came from his heart. And it was something mysterious took place in this deep sleep where God took something from the breast of Adam and closed up the place. And that something that he took from his breast, he made, he builded, the Hebrew says, into an helpmeet for Adam. And uh, you can toy with this. I, I like to throw you a lot of bones you can put meat on. But if you look at it from that standpoint, you see it's the only time in the human race that a man ever gave birth to another human being. Adam gave birth to Eve. Did he not? Was not Eve a part of his body? And did she not come forth from his body by a miracle of God? And in this tremendous thing that happened here, this life which Eve received, she could not have received apart from the deep sleep of Adam. It was essential. It was necessary. And from this part of Adam's body, which God removed during the deep sleep of Adam, he builded, builded is the word in the Hebrew, and here is what he built. He built a woman. And after he had built a woman, period of time, none of us understand, he brought her unto the man. In the fullness of time, at a strategic moment in history, God brought this woman and made her known to Adam and made Adam known to her. And Adam said, <laughs> and I want to tell you, I'm blessed in discovering what he really said. I was reading one old German translator who said, he said, there aren't any words to put in Hebrew what Adam's intent was when he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. But he said, as near as I can say it, he took one look at Eve and he said, this is it. Isn't that precious? This is it. Somehow he sensed that it was everything his bones lacked, everything his flesh needed, everything he, the man, was short, everything that he lacked to make him complete and fulfilled, everything that brought purpose into his life. He looked at Eve and he said, this is it. And I coined another phrase for it, because I always wondered where in the scriptures Adam ever told Eve he loved her. This is where he told her. 
He looked into her face and said, this is it. I love you. That's what I love you really means. This is it. You're the one. Is that right? You're the one. You're the one I need. You're the one I want. You're the one I must have. You're the one that will put purpose into my life. You're the one that will make me whole. You're the one that will complete me. You're the one that will fulfill me. You're the one God made for me. You're mine. I sense it. Part of me. As though we're one. And Adam entered in to an immediate consciousness of his oneness with her when he stood in her presence. Eve knew that she was of him. And when Adam looked at her, he saw a woman that no other man had ever seen before and no one else had ever seen before. She'd been hidden and unrevealed down deep inside of Adam and was never made manifest until God, during his deep sleep, brought her forth. And when Adam looked upon her, he saw in her what she would be to him. He sensed what she meant to him. And he named her woman. Now, it's interesting, this term woman. Why did he call her woman? Did you suppose he went around all through the garden saying, Hey, woman, come here. Woman is, is the feminine of, of the word man. The noun man. In fact, a more literal translation of this word would be he named her manness. Not madness, as most women are, but manness. He named her manness. And in doing that, don't you see, it's important to understand it. Adam gave to her his very own name. He hadn't given a name to anything else in creation. He hadn't shared it with a living thing. He gave all the animals, all the birds, all the living creatures their own peculiar names, but not a soul did he ever share his name with. Until he saw Eve and he said, this is it. She gets my name. Whatever's involved in my name, whatever's involved in me, whatever's involved in my relationship with the eternal God, whatever my purpose is in time and eternity, she shares it with me from this day on. She is as I am, and I will call her manness. And so there's a mystery here. <laughs> this woman was in Adam, though unrevealed and unknown, and then she was taken out of him during the deep sleep, and then, mystery of all mysteries, she was placed back in him again, but in a way that she would never be separated from him again. When Eve saw Adam, she discovered for the first time what her purpose in life was. She looked into the face of Adam. She could look around the entire creation and know that nothing and no one would ever satisfy her or would ever attract her again, save Adam. And to coin that love song, she had eyes for nobody else. She saw in Adam the fulfillment of everything for which she was born, for her very existence. And she saw something that God had created in Adam that she could love without any restraint, could commune with, could share together with him the grace of life, could share his lordship and his rule, enjoy his fellowship, meet the empty place in his heart and have him meet the empty place in her heart. And she saw in him someone she could give herself to and allow him to totally possess her without fear, without guilt. Someone she could submit to. Someone who would make her, by his love, what she needed to be to him and what she wanted to be to him. And she saw in him someone who held the secret, listen carefully to these things, to all her fulfillment and to all her joy and to all her peace. For she saw in the face of Adam that if she would seek his joy, his peace, and his happiness, 
she would in the seeking of that joy and peace and happiness find her own. You get that, wives? That may be what's wrong in your marriage. And then we're told in the close of this story that this is the eternal purpose for which men leave their fathers and mothers, is that they might be joined, glued, or married to their own wives. And this whole thing is a love relationship. It's a love affair, and I'm going to talk to you about it here. This love affair is about Jesus, and I hate to be so selfish and just talk about Jesus and me, but it's about Jesus and you if you're saved. Because if you're saved, you're his bride. You're his wife. You've been joined to him, and he's been joined to you. And this is how it all took place. In the beginning, somewhere in the distant past, somewhere in the eternal ages, beyond all time and beyond the foundation of the world, and I say that correctly, because Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the very world itself. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, the bride is referred to as the Lamb's bride. And as long as there has been a Lamb in the eternal mind and purpose of God, there has been a bride. And so somewhere way back yonder in the distant time and eternity that only God can discern and understand, God saw in all of his creation a need. The need was in himself. A need was in himself and manifested later in the person of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we have to get to so we can understand it. It was not good for him to be alone. God desired for him just as Abraham desired for Isaac, a bride for his son. He desired a wife. He desired a helpmeet. He saw the need, and by his own sovereign will, he determined, predestined, to make or to create for his son an exact counterpart. And doesn't that ring a bell to you when you read the New Testament when it says that we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son? God saw this need that in all of creation there wasn't anyone or anything that was fit for his son. A bride for his son would have to be worthy of his son. You with me? A bride for his son would have to be fit for his son. What king would give his son in marriage unless that bride were worthy of a king's son? And God saw that in all creation there was no one worthy. For all the holy creatures in heaven cried out day and night, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy. But never had they sung the worthiness or the goodness of a creature. And God saw that in this fact alone, He in the person of His Son would abide alone for all eternity. And He said, It's not good. There isn't any that's fit for my son. There isn't any that can help him. Who can help him? There isn't any that can be good for him. Yet without someone as his exact counterpart to help him, he is incomplete. For there is no one who can share his name, his glory, and his lordship. And if you ever had a good thing happen to you, or if you ever found a good thing, you know it's not nearly half the fun to share it just with yourself as it is to share it with someone else. When a good thing happens to you, you want to tell it to somebody. When a good thing comes to you, you want to show it to somebody. That's half the joy, isn't it, in sharing it with someone? And no one, no one could share the glory and no one could share the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he was alone and God saw that he was alone. And he said, I'm going to make him an exact counterpart. But he had to do it in a way that only the New Testament scriptures can make understandable to us. He did it through a very deep sleep. 
and this deep sleep could not take place in heaven. It had to take place on the earth where the Holy Son of God came and for a little season was made lower than the angels that he might be in a place where he could be put into a deep sleep. But more than that, he came and entered the human race that he might join or glue or marry himself to the human race so that out of his deep sleep a way might be made that a bride might be married and glued and joined to him, and that he might find in her all that he lacked and all that he needed and all that he wanted to express the purposes of the eternal God, and that she might find in him the purpose of her very existence, what she lacked and what she needed, that she might declare the eternal purposes of God in her for all eternity. You see, that's interesting, isn't it? You like that? Are you making any personal reference to it? It's you we're talking about here. Never, never fail to remember that the cross was not a tragedy that was brought on by Satan and man. Remember that the cross was caused by the living God. Remember that it was his divine counsel that Jesus die. And remember that the cross of Calvary was a deep sleep which God brought upon him. And when he went into the deep sleep of Calvary's eternal death, when he died forsaking his father and mother, that he might be joined in judgment to the bride he longed for. You with me? Oh, brethren, when he fell into that deep sleep, God took from him something that was his by right, something that had always been his, something he didn't have to give up, he didn't have to lay down, something that was his by right to keep and to hold forever and ever, but something he must sacrifice if he ever find in Eve that which he needed and wanted and longed for, for the glory of God. He gave up, brethren, something from his breast, something from his heart. He gave up his own eternal life. He laid down in the deep sleep of Calvary and died in the blessed hope of being wakened in the presence of Eve. Now you see, we talk too much about laying down and dying and awaking in the presence of Jesus. But you never think too much about him laying down and dying in the blessed hope of awaking in the presence of Eve. That's how much he wanted you, and that's how much he loved you, and that's how much he longed for you, and that's how much he needed you. And when the hour came, God caused it. God brought it to pass. God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, sent him into the deep sleep of Calvary's hell, Calvary's judgment, Calvary's separation, and there, in that death and by that dying, he gave birth through the giving up of his own life to a woman who never existed save in the eternal purposes and mind of God, right? Out of his breast and out of his heart and out of his life came Eve. The very life she got was his, you see. And there could have been no life apart from his death. And we must never forget that the bride is the bride of the Lamb. The bride came out of his humiliation and out of his rejection, out of his innocent slaughter, came out of him going to the cross like a sheep to the shears and a lamb to the slaughter. We came out of the Lamb's work, and the Lamb meekly did it all in the hope, again let me repeat that because I love it, of awaking from his deep sleep in the presence of his beloved bride. God said that he would do this, and then he did it. Brethren, when our last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, laid down in the deep sleep of Calvary, and God took something from him, 
God began, and listen to this phrase, and I don't know all that it means, but I'll throw it out there. He began to build a woman. Now, there's a mystery here that I don't understand, and I'm sure I can't explain it. But back here in Adam's story in Genesis 2, verse 22, it says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And somewhere in that little word, and, I see the whole dispensation of grace. Out of the deep sleep of Calvary, God took something and he made a woman, but this woman had to be builded. And she was later brought to Adam and presented to him as a finished product, needing no embellishment of his own. And that time hasn't come yet, you see, in the history of the church. She is yet to be presented to the Lord Jesus Christ without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle or any such thing. And all in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, I hope the Lord will let me keep on preaching on this for a week or two until I can get to that. John was called up into a high point by an angel of God and he was shown something. And when God showed him this something, it was called the New Jerusalem, the holy city of God. But the angel said, Really, John, it's the bride, the Lamb's wife. She's made herself ready, John. Look at her. And oh, she was a sight to behold. Because the New Jerusalem, brethren, oh, I'm going to tell you about this one of these days. I can't tell you this more. It's too big. The New Jerusalem is the bride, the Lamb's wife, in all of her eternal perfection and in all of the accomplished redemption for which the Lord Jesus went down in the deep sleep of Calvary. But she's being builded now, and yet on the other hand, there's a mystery. The mystery is that even though she's being builded into a woman, into a wife, and let me throw this in, just because you had a ceremony that involved a woman doesn't necessarily mean you got a wife. A wife and a bride are not the same thing, you know. A bride is just a woman who's been accepted by a man and who has accepted a man, but a wife is that same woman being made into what that man needs and what he wants. Lots of people are married to women. Very few are married to wives. Now, you just meditate on that for a little while, will you? And before she was a wife, she was a bride. And brides are not necessarily wives. And she must be built into a wife. Yet the miracle of it all is, in Ephesians 5, she's already referred to as his wife, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he does not deny her the single privilege of the wife, though she is yet not as she shall be. You with me? Or did I lose you there somewhere? He accepts her not as if she is, but as she will be. He receives her not as she actually is, but as she actually will be. And though she is spotted and wrinkled and blemished and every such thing now, the Lord Jesus receives her as though she is a spotless, clean, holy, virgin wife who has been made into everything he needs and everything he wants because it was all assured when she became part of him. So I left you with two sides of the coin there. She's a bride, yet she's a wife. She's only begun to be built, and yet she's built it and finished. So it depends on which side of time and eternity you're looking on. But let me impress this upon you, brethren. We who have believed on the Lord Jesus are that spotless bride. And he went down into death that we might become his wife. And now Paul says in Ephesians, we are indeed his wife, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And now I just, I'm sorry, I just have to talk about myself because I don't know how to relate to you any other way. I know this from experience, and every one of you who are saved know it from experience that in the fullness of time God brought me to that last Adam. No, he didn't bring Adam to me. He brought me to Adam. God the Holy Spirit brought me to the Lord Jesus Christ. Did he not bring you? 
God brought me. I didn't want to come, but he brought me anyway. I wasn't looking for Adam. Adam was looking for me through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit found me like the faithful servant of Abraham, Elysia, who found Rebecca at the curbstone of the well and brought her to Isaac. So the Holy Spirit found me, and so he found you. And in the fullness of time, he brought me to Jesus and made me aware of Adam and made Adam aware of me. And let me tell you that I knew the very same thing that Eve knew in that day in the garden. I discovered in one moment when I came to know Jesus as my Savior what I was born for. I came to know in one moment what my purpose in this life was. And I came to discover in one moment that he hadn't come to me, that I'd been brought to him by some power and will and some force that I didn't understand. But I had been brought into the presence of the one for whom my soul longed. I had been brought into the presence of the one, and suddenly as I looked upon him, I knew that I was a part of him, and I knew by the way he looked at me that he was a part of me. You know what Jesus sees in every sinner who comes to him to be saved? He sees a bride, and he also sees a wife. He sees and he saw in me someone that had never been seen before. Because <laughs> love creates, you know. The power of love creates. And the love of Christ for me saw in me someone the world had never seen. Oh, you can't see that someone yet. But someday when I see him as he is, I'll be made like him and then you will see the someone he saw. You'll see the spotless, pure bride he loves so passionately this morning. He loves me, and he loves you. We're his very own. He sees in us what no one else can see, for he sees what the power of his love will make me. And he sees that by the power of that love he will shape me to his every need and shape me to his every want. He sees in me... And I see in him, I experience and he experiences a consciousness of our oneness. Eve shared a fellowship with Adam that no living creature ever shared before or after. You and I share a fellowship with him that no one else will ever share. Do you realize that? He'll share his possessions with many more. He'll share his fellowship, in that sense, with many more, his friendship with many more, his presence, his lordship, and many other things, but he shares only his heart with his bride. She shares a part of him that no one else, no other thing in this whole creation can share. It's no wonder we're called the chosen, the elect, the specially privileged and blessed of all dispensations of time. We were taken from his heart, and put back, brethren, in his heart. And we are the only living creatures of all time and eternity that share his name, that are fit to share his name, that are fit to help him, and that are set of God to be good for him. Now that staggers all my imagination, but I swear that his solemn statement's a fact. And while we're talking about mysteries, I just as well whip another one on you. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, and as long as there was a lamb, there was a bride. And I was in him before the foundation of the world. And yet in some mystical way at the cross of Calvary, I was taken out of him. And taken out of him at the cross of Calvary, I was put back in him and put back in him in a way that completed and fulfilled him and all of the eternal purposes of God, and fulfilled and completed me, and made me know for once what the purpose of it all was, and that was to the glory and praise of the grace of our God in Jesus Christ. I suppose you've discovered this fact of life. I wrote about it in the quest of the soul, but I'll remind you of it one more time. You were...
created in a very special way. God formed you. Read in the Old Testament how often he tells that. He made you just like you are. And maybe you don't really understand how he made you, but the way you're created, he designed you and fashioned you like a man sits down and draws a blueprint. He made you unique. And in the unique way in which he made you, he did one thing that we all have in common. He made an empty place in you that can never be filled apart from Jesus Christ. He left in you a longing that no other human being on this earth can satisfy. He left in you an emptiness that no other human being on this earth can ever fill. He left in you a desire, a longing, a passionate desire and longing for love that no human love can ever meet. He left in you, brethren, something incomplete, and you will never find it until you discover it in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. I see this thing shining out of every aspect of our life. I was talking the other day about this craze that the human race has to join something. That's why organizations flourish. Everybody's got to join something because there's something down inside of each one of us that realizes that we cannot find our own personal identity unless we find it in the identity of some group, some organization, some cause, some purpose in life. Always that seeking of identity down inside us that seeks to express itself in the Mass. Now, brethren, that was put there by design, that when you were joined to the body of Jesus Christ, you'd say like Adam, that's it. In finding my identity in him, I found my own identity. I'm his, and he is mine. I found in the Lord Jesus when I was married to him, and he was married to me, I found someone that I could love without any restraint. You say, can't you find anybody else? No one. No one. Why? Well, he fixed me in that way, too. He won't let me love a human being without restraint. Because he knows that sooner or later that human being will crush me, will hurt me, will deceive me, will let me down, will fail me. Not because they do it deviously, but because they do not have the capacity. You with me? Because they don't have the enablement, because they can't. And he wants to save me the heartbreak, but oh, when he brought me to Jesus, he said, you can love him with all your heart. You can pull all the stops. You can release all the love that's bottled up there. You can pour it all on him, and you'll never be sorry for it, and you'll never be disappointed, and you'll never be let down, and you'll never be hurt, and you'll never be forsaken. And when you try to love a human being like that, you're asking that human being to be Jesus. And you're going to get hurt. He's the only one we can release the full fountain of love bottled up inside of all of us upon. And all oh, brethren, don't you realize that that's the only duty he ever gave you? It's the only responsibility he ever laid upon you? Because it's the one thing he wants, it's the one thing he needs, and it's the one thing that he can't exist without. He wants me to love him. That's all he wants. And he says, pull out all the stuff and love me all you want. You can't love me too much. You'll never reach the end where you're disappointed and say, I wish I hadn't committed so much to Jesus. Whosoever believeth on him, the scripture says, will not be ashamed. And the scripture promises me that I can commune with him. He and I share together the grace of life, just like husband and wife. Make babies, you know. So Jesus and his precious wife share in the grace of life in that the Spirit and the bride together say come and bring into existence those beautiful eternal lives that never existed before. You understand what I'm talking about? Getting people saved is what I'm talking about. It's the work of the Lord Jesus, the blessed groom, as his wife submits to him and gives herself to him for the purpose for which God placed him here. Now, in finding him and him finding me, he's filled that empty place. He's someone that I can allow to totally possess me. 
That's one of the troubles in marriage is that husbands want to totally possess their wives and wives want to totally possess their husbands and this can't ever be in this life because there isn't any human being who can handle the total possession of another. I'll tell you the only one who can, Jesus. You can trust him to totally possess you. You can give yourself over to him. That's the reason the scripture says submit to him. Submit to him. Let him totally possess you. Let him use you. Let him do whatever he wants to do with you, to you, for you, and through you. You're not of his mercy. You're the blessed object of his love. You're the blessed object of his love. Do you hear that? Submit to him in that kind of way that you want him to totally and completely and fully possess you. And if you'll do that, he will by his love make you not only what he needs and what he wants, He'll make you what you want to be and what you need to be, and he'll make you love it and love him while he's doing it. Eve was told that she would have her desires to the man. Let me throw this out, and I'm going to make one of the first references in this message to married life here on the earth, because it might save your marriage if there's still time to do it. Listen carefully. The woman was created to have her desires to the man as Eve, the blessed church, the sinners saved by grace, are created to have their desires unto him. I witness people around me living in the married relationship where wives have their desires someplace else besides to their husbands. And if you seek happiness somewhere else besides seeking the happiness of your husband, you'll never find it. If you seek joy in seeking it someplace else besides seeking first the joy of your husband, you'll never find it. If you try to be fulfilled and in the trying to be fulfilled you seek fulfillment somewhere else, then in your husband you will never find it. The secret to happiness for the Christian woman, the secret to her joy, the secret to her fulfillment, the secret to the full purposes of God in her is to set before her in life one thing, to seek the joy, the happiness, and the fulfillment of her husband, because the scripture says she was made for the man, and the man wasn't made for the woman. If you don't like that, you women livers, you'll have to get yourself another Bible, because this is exactly what it teaches, and this is why the world is filled with unfulfilled women, unhappy women, sorrowful women, sad, gloomy women, who are out rolling around looking for other men, because they think if they find another man, they can find the fulfillment they want. They can't. They can find it in their husband if they're married to one who's been made one place with them. And if they look for it someplace else, they never find it. They die unhappy. You can't find it in your children, women. Many of you women have substituted your children for your husband. You think it's terrible if a woman seeks another man besides her husband. What about a woman who gives to her children the love, the devotion, the time, lets herself be possessed by her children? and so robs her husband of everything for which she was created to give to him. Are you with me? It's called a breakdown in communications, but it's more than that. It's robbery. And oh, don't let this happen to you in your relationship to Jesus. Listen to me, brethren. You want joy in the Christian life? I'll tell you how to find it. Get these facts straight. I'm the bride. I'm the wife of the Lord Jesus. I want joy. Where will I find it? And the Holy Spirit will answer you this way. Seek it by seeking the joy of Jesus. You can't rejoice in the Lord unless the Lord's rejoicing in you. You want peace? Minister to the peace of Jesus. You want happiness? Minister to the happiness of Jesus. You want fulfillment? Minister to that which fulfills him. You want contentment? Minister to that which contents him. Share his heart and he'll share his with you. Share his life, and he'll share his with you. Seek him first, and you'll find in the setting of him first in your heart every good thing you desire today. That's why you can't find it in things. That's why you can't find it in places. That's why you can't find it in people. You can't find it anywhere unless you find it in Jesus. He left his father at the cross of Calvary in death. And he left his mother. His earthly mother was Israel. He left his father and he left his mother for one reason. 
that he might cleave, be joined, be married, be glued to you. He made the first move. I'm going to marry myself, I'm going to glue myself, I'm going to join myself to you. And I'm going to go down in the deep sleep, forsaking my father, forsaking my mother, in the hope that when I rise, you will be joined, glued, or married to me through faith in what I've done for you. The cross bleeding to me, and when I was saved, the Holy Spirit, by his baptism, glued me to him. And what God has joined together, no one can put us under. And I have to talk for just a minute here at the end of this message about his love for me, because that's not been on my heart for two or three weeks. And when I talk about his love for me, I'm talking about his love for you, if you're saved. There's a mystery about his love. First of all, that he loved me so much that he gave himself for me. He loves me so much that he loves me as he loves himself. And you know that when Adam received Eve, Eve was God's love gift to him. It was God who brought Eve to Adam. Adam who received Eve as a love gift from the hand of God so that when she became bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, when God loved Adam, he also loved Eve. And when he loved Eve, he loved her with all of the love of Adam. And do you know that when God placed me in the Lord Jesus Christ, God loves me with the same love wherewith he loves his Son. And when he loves me, he's only loving me through the Son's love. And when he loves the Son, he's loving me. When he's accepted the Son, he's accepted me. When he's received the Son, he's received me. You can't take Adam without Eve. Wherever Adam goes, Eve goes too. Whoever Adam is, so is Eve. Whatever Adam is, so is Eve. Whatever he becomes, so does she. She shares not only his name, his life, his heart. Oh, I can't find enough words to tell you about this blessed union between those who are saved and the Lord Jesus. Once distinct, once two, once separate persons, now made just one, not only in the sight of God, but in each other's eyes and in each other's sight. And I just have to tell you some more about this love. It's the kind of love that's unique. There isn't any other kind of love like it. I love my children, but the basis of that love and the love that I have for my brothers and for my sisters, for my mother and for my father, that love is based on human relationship. Now I have a love for others. It's a natural love. And then there is this kind of love. Jesus doesn't love me, and I don't love him simply because we're related. He doesn't love me, and I don't love him simply because it's natural and we have common desires and common interests. There's only one kind of love like this. It's a love that delights in the person of each other. And that's the reason why Adam's story ends with this statement that when God had made them one, they were possessed of such love, such delight in one another that they were both naked. And yet they were unashamed. And you know what that means? It means Eve was satisfied with what she saw in Adam. And Adam was satisfied with what he saw in her. It means that Eve was delighted in what she saw in Adam. And Adam was delighted in what he saw in Eve. And let me tell you now, it doesn't take anything to say that I'm delighted when I look at Jesus. And I'm satisfied when I look at Jesus, but oh, it takes some faith to say to you that when he looks at me, he's satisfied, and when he looks at me, he's delighted. He loves what he sees, and he loves who he sees, for he sees me not as you see me, brethren. He sees me as though he were looking at himself, and to love me is to love himself. To see in me is to see himself, and every day by his Holy Spirit, I, his precious bride, am being made and transformed from glory to glory until I finish in the image of this blessed Son.
I'm not ashamed of what I see in Jesus. And I thank God he's not ashamed in what he sees in me. A lot of people are ashamed of me. I want to tell you somebody it isn't. Jesus is. He's satisfied in what he sees. Are you satisfied with what you see? Are you delighted in his love as he is delighted in your love? How's your married life with Jesus? How is your married life with Jesus? How are you getting on with him? I'd like to tell you some more about that, but I have to save it for another message because I got more than I can ever get in this morning. I've got two or three more messages along this line you ought to have. Would you like to hear some more on this Sunday? Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this privilege. Help each one of us every morning of our lives to say, how's our married life with Jesus? Oh, Father, thank you that he's satisfied with me. And a greater miracle than that is that I'm satisfied with him. Oh, Father, like Eve, as I look around this creation, there's no one and no thing who will ever satisfy me or attract me again. To him I can give myself fully and completely. And, oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that you will possess me fully, totally, wholly. I submit myself to you. Do to me, do through me, do for me, do by me. All that delights you, all that pleases you. I want your joy first in my life. For when you're happy, I'll be happy. When you're joyful, I'll be joyful. When your desires are met, mine will be met. When your purposes in life are fulfilled, mine will be fulfilled. When you find your rightful place, I'll find mine. When you are no longer lonely, I will never be lonely. Thank you for this union. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Lord bless you.